He's from Medical University of South Carolina, and his talk is the use of novel biostatistics and methods by researchers publishing in general internal medicine journals. Well, thanks again for uh, inviting me, and we'll be so this is shifting gears a little bit here, and I am aware most of you probably haven't had that much contact with biostatistics, so I thought I'd just touch base on what is biostatistics. It's really the application of statistics to biomedical research. Um, we, use, you know, we apply math various mathematical principles to the collection, and analysis, and presentation of data. And when we, when we say biostatistics, you know, it, it's almost always involving some studies with humans or with animals. Um, there, I mean, lot, there are obviously lots of fields of other, other fields of statistics, and there's a lot of overlap. But we end up learning a lot about the science of behind what we're studying, as well as the mathematics. And so here are just some, uh, a few areas where biostatisticians really impact biomedical research. So certainly in public health, um, health services research, clinical trials is a huge area. So in other words, when you're, when you're testing new drugs or new devices, we do randomized clinical trials. I'd say about half of our biostatisticians are actually working in specifically in clinical trials. I do a little bit of that, but that's not my focus. I consider myself more of a generalist, you know, kind of looking at a lot of different um, applications. Uh, certainly genetics, as we heard earlier. Um, diagnostic or prognostic prediction. I've actually just been recently getting involved with that. I'm trying to uh, come up with a model of predicting lung cancer based on um, information in the, gained from uh, CT images. Um, certainly drug development, um, developing new behavioral treatments, the, the list just goes on and on, but it's, a, it's always a new field. Every day is a new uh, opportunity, which a lot of, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. I really feel blessed to be doing something new and on the cutting edge uh, every day. So what I thought about is, this, I don't know why I started thinking about these um, this topic, but I thought my, my rationale here is that um, the novel biostatistical methods are constantly being developed. And typically, what people do is they develop a new method and then they go to a talk somewhere, you know, like here, and oops, um, they give a presentation at some meeting and then they publish their findings in a journal and they say, oh, great, now my method's out there, um, everybody should use it. Um, but it's it's not that simple. And so I, I was trying to see, well, how much impact are we really having? Uh, and so I thought, um, I wanted to see how much our, our work impacts real world problems. And I used the field of general internal medicine, um, perhaps because, uh, so when I, when I talk about general internal medicine journals, you've probably heard of the uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, um, the Lancet is out of England. Um, these are the top ones you've probably heard of before, but there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and I, I, I've just worked with a lot of internal medicine physicians over the years, and so I, I know a little bit about gentlemen internal medicine. So, I just, uh, please tell me that you've not been involved in this paper. I'm not trying to pick on this one. But here's just an example of some new biostatistic method that was published. Parametric and non-parametric confidence intervals of the probability identifying early, early disease stage given sensitivity to full disease and, spec and specificity within th with, uh, three ordinal diagnostic groups. Now, I'm sure that's a very useful biostatistics method, but I just kind of wonder, how relevant is that? If somebody publishes a paper like this, is anybody ever going to use it? You know, this question, when are we, when are we going to use that? I'm sure you've heard that from students before. If you're a student, you probably asked it. When I was a student, you know, back in elementary school, I remember asking that question. And part of the reason I went into biostatistics was because, I mean, I remember it, you know, I remember being eight years old, and I knew that I was going to be a mathematician, and I was going to help solve real-world problems. I didn't know, I knew that when I was young, but I didn't, I didn't never, I never heard of biostatistics. But when I got, when I was, um, after I graduated from college, I, I taught for a little while, and that was fun, but I, I, I didn't quite satisfy me. And when I read about biostatistics, all of a sudden I said, that's my calling. 
And it's fun because we get to use math every day to solve real world problems. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about what, um, let's, let's keep going. So I, I wanted to get a sense of what were the new methods that are being published now and, and how are they being used um, in the field of, of general internal medicine. Because really as biostatisticians, the biostatistics shouldn't be the end goal. The, the goal should be that we do something that ends up getting used to help um, solve you know, health problems and people and, and you know, cure disease, things like that. So I, I need to just um, briefly touch on this thing called a, a journal impact factor. It's, um, it's just a, a number that's recognized as it's an imperfect measure of how, how much a, a journal impacts research. But it's considered one of the best ways to evaluate the quality or influence of a journal. Um, a lot of times if you Google a certain journal or if you type in, you know, New England Journal and impact factor, it'll say, our impact factor is 10. You know, that's a really high one. You know, a low one might be like half. And it's basically a function of the citation counts from the prior year's publications. I don't know the exact um, algorithm for it, but it, the higher the number, the more, the more times its um, articles are being cited. So the goal of my study was to identify which statistical articles, which statistical journals, and what new methods have had the most direct impact on the fields of research represented in general internal medicine journals. So really I'm looking at you know, the actual the specific articles, what journals, and the, and the methods. So this is how we did that. The first thing I did was I identified the top 40 journals in what's called the Statistics and Probability category. It's defined by this uh, group called the Journal Citation Report Scientific Edition from Thomson Reuters. So I'm, I'm actually working, uh, one of my collaborators was a librarian, and I've never collaborated with, I mean, I've, I've certainly, you know, gone to a librarian for help, but I've never, you know, literally collaborated on a research project with a librarian, and she was very uh, instrumental in helping me think through the framework for actually answering this question. So, um, so we, in other words, we picked the top 40 journals. Um, I kind of threw, I, I sent that list around to some of my colleagues, and they said, well, what about the, the, they gave me a couple more names, so we added five to that list. Uh, and then what we did was we looked, we, so we identified the top, these 45 journals. Then we looked in, um, in this uh, Internet uh, Web of Science Citation, um, Science Citation Index, it's a big database that can identify all the articles that were published in this other field, that they, and this was the closest one to what I consider general internal medicine. It's called Medicine, General and Internal, that cited one or more articles in the statistics and probability journals. So you kind of have the, the journals that I'm interested in, now I have the, the internal medicine um, journals, and we're kind of looking at the overlap here. And so the other I wanted to look at recent methods, so I said that both the citing article and the cited article must have been in English language manuscripts in this time period. Um, I think we started in 2010, so that's why I, have, I went through that decade. Um, also, I realized, I recognized that there's going to be a lag time for between when an article is published and until when it's actually cited. So I kind of wanted to, I, I kind of grouped my biostatistics articles by 2000 2006, and I did it separately for 07 to 09. And then we kind of um, got all the articles, and, and we managed them using Excel. So, for, so for the other thing, to, if you've ever published an article, if you've read a, an, an article in, um, in a journal, in a medical journal, I imagine in mathematical journals are there too. But usually you have to come up with some keywords. So the keywords are, are, are in these um, databases, that the, the Thompson Reuter database that I was talking about. And so here are, oh, so there's lots and lots of different keywords. Sometimes the, the, the um, investigator will put their own keyword in. Sometimes they're assigned by you know, somebody, like a librarian somewhere. But what we did was we had just thousands and thousands and thousands of these keywords, and what we did, I went through the list, and we, we kind of mapped them into some broader categories so that we could kind of 
um, make some sense out of them. Um, so analysis of correlated data, that's a very, that's a topic I actually work in a lot these days. Bayesian methods, um, bias, bioinformatics methods. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, um, about this one, meta-analysis, because it'll pop up later. Um, but these are basically the categories that we mapped all the keywords. I also included um, non-statistical terms because, you know, terms like men or, you know, African Americans or, you know, there's terms that don't have any statistics meanings would, would end up in here as well. So we, that was actually um, a large component of, our, of the keywords. So, we ended up identifying over 10,000 unique articles published in these uh, general internal medicine journals from in this decade. And a whopping total of 900 of these articles cited a biostatistics or probability article. So I thought that was a little bit low, and that was, that was part of the reason why I was doing the studies. I, I want to kind of try to urge people to do two things. One is to do relevant work, and also to do work, also to promote their work so that it is used. But that's just one little part of this. Uh, the, we ended up with a total of um, 1,636 citations. So certainly a paper, you can cite lots of different articles. You can cite more than one article, and um, some of the articles could have been cited multiple times. So we ended up with this is 1,600 citations of about 600 unique um, articles. So among the cited articles, the median number of citations was four, with about 20% of these articles being cited only once. Now, I didn't even look at the ones that were never cited, but there are a lot of them out there, too. Um, this is just another outline of that process. So these were, this is in the, uh, the first um, 2000 to 2006. So this guy's article popped up and was cited 66 times, so it's published in this journal, Biometrics. Um, it's looking at something called publication bias and meta-analysis, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, Another one here, heterogeneity and meta-analysis. Uh, Truman Field for accounting for publication, publication bias and meta-analysis. Um, this one stands out, it's about validating a prognostic model. And this is multiple imputation and missing, missing values. Um, this is actually a, a hot topic now. In other words, suppose you have a bunch of data that you've collected on a, on a bunch of patients, but for whatever reason some data are missing and you're doing an analysis that needs to use that information. You throw the whole subject out because they're missing from data. Um, there's a lot of biostatistics methods that deal now with imputing missing values. So that's why this one's popping up. I also noticed here that uh, this guy Duval is cited twice, Tweedy cited twice. Um, I believe this guy Pagan, I, I think he's on the next page. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the top ten. So these are the these are the bottom five of the top ten. Um, you know, they're being cited twenty four times down to fifteen. So this is those are the top ten from that first part of two thousand and two thousand six. Um, so we see um, this thing called meta regression. That's uh, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, again, missing values. Here's an economics uh, paper that's in here. Um, that's that was only real. That was the highest studied economics paper that was uh, that I found. Um, here's another thing about cost cost data, and this thing about bootstrapping, which has is a way of of, of uh, internally val internally validating some of your research findings. So this is the bottom the bottom. Um, excuse me, the top five from the later part, 2007-2009. So this is the more, more recent group. Um, and so again, we have meta-analysis methods, um, networks of randomized trials, um, propensity score models. This is, these are really cool. These are, these are methods to help um, compare treatments when the treatments are not randomly assigned. So, say so you want to study whether people on a certain type of antihypertensive agent 
do better than people who are assigned another antihypertensive drug? Well, normally the answer to that question you have to do a randomized trial, but they don't always do randomized trials. And you, there's ways to, to, to predict what would happen if you did a randomized trial. And that's, that's what these propensity score models are all about. Um, so again, we have some missing data methods, and again, uh, something about publication bias. The other thing, so, so statistics and medicine pops up, American statistician statistics method. As you can see that, um, that some of these journals are popping up more than once, too. So I thought just for a minute what I'd do is, is talk about what is meta-analysis, because I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but it's, it's basically, when we do, you know, part of, part of the scientific process is to, that you want to be able to do research, but then you want to be able to repeat it. And so a lot of times you'll find the same topic addressed multiple times in, in the medical literature. And so I, I pulled, this is a meta-analysis, it's called obstructive sleep apnea and the risk of motor vehicle crash. So sleep apnea meaning you're, you're waking up and you look, you're, you're, you're not breathing uh, properly while you sleep at night. And, you know, let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, about ten or so different studies that have all looked at the risk of motor vehicle crash for people who have sleep apnea. And this, this risk is, um, um, is, is uh, quantified using something called a rate ratio. It's, it's probably you know, something about the, purported, the, the frequency of crashes among people who have sleep apnea compared to the, the frequency of motor vehicle crash when they, among people who don't have it. But if the risk is one, that basically says that they have the same risk. And so if, there is, if there's truly an effect here, you would expect the risk to be over here somewhere. And, and this is a typical uh, uh, graph that you would see in a meta-analysis where you, you have a, uh, the rate ratio or it could be an odds ratio or, or some metric is, is graphed. Um, the, the width of these, this, this line here has to do with something called confidence interval. Um, basically the, the tighter that is, that means the more confident they are in estimating that, that effect. And at the bottom here you see this, this line here is summarizing, basically pooling all those results together. That's what meta-analysis is. It's taking information across these 10 studies, bringing it all together, and coming up with a final number and, a, and some kind of confidence interval around that final number. Now often, when you're doing meta-analysis, you don't have the original data that was collected. All you have are the results that are put into the journal article. And so there are lots of different techniques to how you pull that together. In some of those articles I put up there, there's a, there's a discussion about publication bias. So does anybody have an idea what publication bias is? If you if you publish something, you're gonna, in order to get it published, you think, oh, I gotta publish something that's significant, that's a, something that's meaningful. Who wants to publish a study that says that there's no risk? Okay? What happens is, if people, people do a study, and they find something that looks really important, they go publish it. If they find something that's not very important, they tend to not publish it. Now, it doesn't always happen, but there's this, there's this bias. And so, there are ways to assess that. Usually, it has, there are these things called uh, funnel plots, where you look at the size of the study, how many people were enrolled in the study, and then you'll realize that the larger studies will also often have um, smaller effects that, that are closer to one here. And the, the smaller studies will be, oh yeah, we saw, we saw this great uh, finding out here. And it's, it's, it's real, it's, it's talked about, that bias is, is present. It's, it's, hard to, um, it's hard to get around that. I've, I've personally tried to publish a few negative studies, and a negative study meaning you look at a risk factor and you find that it's not, it's not a risk factor for, for some event like a uh, motor vehicle crash. So, let's see. Oh, this was, these are the, the journals that were, that were cited most frequently. And this did, nothing was surprising here. 
The Statistics in Medicine is our top journal. Um, I actually had never published anything in Statistics in Medicine before, and I, I've always wanted to get a paper in there. So, guess where I tried to publish this? <laughs> I, I sent it to Statistics in Medicine, and I was really nervous because it, I, I was thinking, what if they say no? You know, if they say no, who's going to want to publish this? Who's going to want who wants to? One of these guys wants to publish my findings that says statistics and medicine is better. No. Thankfully, they accepted it. So this did get uh, published in December. Um, let's see. But there's, oh, this one. I actually never heard of this one before. This is actually a software uh, package we use. The Stata is a, is a statistical package. And um, I, I think, I almost wonder if, if these aren't really new methods. It's more about just how you use the software. But it, it met the criteria for being in my study. Um, the, the real heavy duty um, mathematical statistics, you know, the, the mathematical papers are in biometrics, statistics in medicine, biostatistics, this one, jazz. Uh, I, I just threw this up here. I wanted to see whether the citation count actually correlated with the, the journal's impact factor. Um, and I, I didn't see much relationship here. In other words, um, this uh, this is statistics and medicine right here. There's a lot of a lot of citations, but its impact factor is actually pretty low. These were kind of the findings from the keyword mappings that I told you about. So um, not, I guess not really surprising here. General, very general terms like models. Um, data interpretation, that, those actually had the highest number of citations. Epidemiology is really the study of risk, risk factors for disease in people. Um, that had a lot of citations. And that's, that's going to be, um, th those are, again, this is internal medicine. So, um, you know, studying heart disease and studying uh, diabetes, hypertension. Um, so it's not surprising that epidemiology is high. Randomized trials, uh, high meta-analysis, missing data, I said that's another kind of topic that's getting a lot of attention. Um, you can imagine what happens when you, when you deal with randomized trials with missing data. Um, if you're the FDA, do you want to allow, you know, they got to come up with some rules about it. Are you allowed to impute data on patients that were in a randomized trial? You know, they have to work these things out, and there's not always, there's not always easy answers to these questions. Um, we'll see. So here's some more. So computer simulation, we do a lot of that. Um, I think I mentioned this analysis of correlated data is a very uh, hot topic. Um, a, lot of what we, a lot of the different statistical models that we use assume that observations are independent from one another. In other words, we assume that if person A is, is being, um, you know, basically if I'm measuring something on people in this room, then your measurements are different from somebody else's measurements. Um, one of the things we, I work in uh, doing some research in um, a, a big network of primary care practices across the United States right now. And it turns out that patients within our practice are, are correlated with each other. They're not independent. Um, because they're all being treated by the same doctor or doctors. And so these little things that seem kind of subtle actually can, can have very big um, effects when you start um, looking at associations at the level of practice. Um, let's see. So bias, like I said, publication bias. They also call it the file drawer problem. I like that. That's, in other words, Oh, you did a study, it didn't come out the way you wanted it. I'm going to stick it in the file. <laughs> stick it. Sometimes called these circular files on the trash. Um, so survival analysis is pretty popular. That's, we have um, different, a whole different set of mathematical models when you look at um, time to event outcomes. So in other words, how long does this patient survive? Or um, how long does this device last in a person. And whenever you do such a study like that, eventually you've got to stop the study and you don't know the actual survival time. It's called censored data. In other words, you know that it lasted at least this long, or the person lived at least this long. 
um, you know, if you're doing a study to, uh, in cancer to uh, see if one drug extends survival, you often don't, you're, you can't study the patients long enough to know everybody's survival time. So you have to deal with this. There's mathematical ways of handling this, that sensory process. So again, statistical software um, is popular. Uh, let's see. Um, bioinformatics methods. So bioinformatics is, uh, so some of the genetic stuff that um, we heard about earlier, that, that kind of falls into this bioinformatics. But these, these people who are doing studies to find ways of, of looking at kind of looking at how genes express themselves and how proteins are expressing themselves in disease and non-disease patients. Um, that's a, a, a big field. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Bayes, Bayesian analyses, but Bayesian is kind of a, um, a different field. Of, I, I, so there's kind of like two classifications of statisticians, and there's frequentists and Bayesians, and I'm more of a frequentist. But a Bayesian a statistician always tries to, to interpret everything given what's, what's, what they know about the process before they do the study. So they take into account prior information and then they do an experiment or, some, or something and then they come up with like a, a kind of a prior belief and a posterior belief. Um, that's, there's a lot of new methods being developed. Sample size estimation, and this is like about, I'd say at least 30% of what I do all day long is come up when I design a study, is how many people do we need, how many mice do we need, how many rats do we need. Um, sometimes it's how many physician practices do we need to include in our study. Econometrics, again, kind of this, it's interesting that the economy, a lot of, I know some economists, and they, do, they use a lot of the same statistical methods we use, but they call it different things. And so whenever we're talking to each other, we have to, I'm always like, oh yeah, he's using this word endogeneity, but I use the word confounding. And they really, we're talking about the same thing. Um, so non-parametrics, uh, diagnostic testing. Um, diagnostic testing is always going to be popular because we're always trying to come up with new ways to diagnose people early when they have, uh, or before they have a disease. Um, you know. Psychometrics really kind of applying um, statistical methods to to psych um, like psychology research, uh, reproducibility of results. I actually was hoping this would have been higher. Uh, as as biostatisticians, we're actually running a lot of computer programs, um, you know, writing a lot of programs, and then a lot of people will get their results from our software package. Then they'll copy them over to Excel and then make a graph and then they'll take that and plop it into a paper they're writing and then they might hand type some of those things or cut and paste and and it's, it's bad, it's sloppy and one of the things that a lot of biostatisticians are pushing for now is trying to find way, ways of actually writing computer code that take the raw data and spit out the final thing without any interruptions in the process so it's all automated in a way that reduces that human error so that our findings are reproducible. Um, and interestingly, I don't know if anybody saw 60 Minutes a, a few weeks ago, there was a cancer doctor and he was at Duke and he ended up um, getting fired. For, um, it was this big scandal because he, a bunch of statisticians figured out that he was fudging his data. And, and it was all about this whole reproducibility. They call themselves forensic biostatisticians. <laughs> so multiple comparisons, dealing with um, this comes up a lot in genetic studies because you have you have to have more measurements than you do people. And whenever you're comparing those measurements, you have to take into account that you're doing one, many, many comparisons. Um, like I said, you have a lot of non-statistical terms here. Actually, that was the biggest category. So just to conclude, less than 9% of these articles uh, cited the statistics probability article. Among about 600 um, articles, we were talking the most frequently, top, the frequently addressed topics were meta-analysis, publication bias, missing data, 
town metrics, frame loss trials, prognostic models. Uh, these three journals, Statistics and Medicine, Statistical Methods and Medical Research, and Biometrics really accounted for um, almost 63% of the citations. And those were the frequently cited keywords. So, just a few discussion points. Relatively few articles are citing novel biostatistical methods. Um, lack of available software could be a barrier. Biostatisticians need to do more to disseminate our findings. So they're really, I would say, so, you're, so our, our, the resources won't have been wasted. Um, so some limitations that I should note that sometimes the novel methods are actually published in clinical journals, and I wouldn't be able, to, I wouldn't have captured them. Um, sometimes something could have been published in this time period, but not not have been cited. But it could end up being cited. You know, 10 years from now, they could say, oh, that's a beautiful article, and all of a sudden it could be really popular. And so I may have missed something that um, uh, hasn't been cited today, but it could end up being very influential. Um, if we looked at a different field of medical research, like in cancer, um, it could be totally different. You know, cancer, is, there's a lot more genetic research going on, so it, we could have seen a totally different set of uh, results. And and there are some times that a method will become almost so, you know, it's kind of like the word Kleenex, you know, you just, we use it to mean just any, any kind of tissue. So there could be something that is popular and all of a sudden everybody just thinks, oh, why do I don't need to cite that? Everybody knows what that is, you know, like, uh, I mean, there's, so that, that could be a limitation. So this is just a couple of final thoughts with emerging, um, so we have a bright future. Um, with emphasis on translational research, comparative effectiveness research, community-based participatory research, personalized medicine. There are always opportunities for statisticians to develop new techniques. And we need to be really mindful of finding optimal ways to promote and market our methods so that our efforts aren't done in vain. And so these are just some ideas I have about writing, writing easily adapted computer programs, um, so writing SAS is a, is a software that I use a lot, so we can write macros that we can put on the web for other people to use. Um, R is a statistical program that's an open source software, and people can write packages and submit them for others to use. Also, just presenting our methods and um, let's see, providing more user friendly descriptions of the techniques. So, you know, putting things out, things out there on web pages or um, Social media applications. So I need to acknowledge my um, colleagues. Uh, Terry Lynn is the librarian. Amy Walkwist is another statistician who works with me. And basically, my the time that I have to spend on this comes uh, is funded by the uh, National Center for Research Resources. All right. Thanks.
his, his, his research was all about, okay, we're going to take your, your tumor, and they're all cancer patients, and we're going to design um, uh, a drug cocktail that's specific for you. And, you know, he was basically saying that approach is a lot better than the traditional approaches. But, I mean, it may be, but not the not way he was. Yeah, I mean, he's giving false data about it. Great. Thanks a lot. Let's thank our speaker again.